Hey, welcome back. So we are uh, talking about crime and deviance this week. It's one of my favorite chapters, so we're going to split it into two weeks. It's something that I think a lot of people are kind of interested in, um, and something that I think is important. So I want to take a whole week just to talk about the crime aspect of it and the criminal justice system and those criminological theories, labeling theory, differential association theory, um, social control theory. These are all really fascinating, really interesting. And um, sometimes can get a little bit complex. So uh, we're going to do those next week. And this week, I, I just kind of want to focus on sort of the, uh, the, the fun, lighthearted side of deviance, um, which isn't always fun and lighthearted, but, but more so <laughs> than crime, right? Uh, so we're going to start off with uh, just a little bit about deviance. Um, and we'll introduce our assignment, which is to... We're just going to ask you to go ahead and violate a norm. Um, and again, we'll talk about how to do that safely. Again, I don't want anybody getting arrested or in trouble or beat up. None of that. None of that. Um, there's all sorts of weird, quirky little norms that you can violate and you can see what the reactions are. But we'll get into that. Let's jump right into uh, some material. So crime and deviance is, it's a bit, like I said, it's a big topic in sociology. And we're going to talk about this week the things that are deviant. Uh, and not necessarily criminal. Um, I want to look at this idea of sort of deviant lifestyles and um, things like that. So the, before we got before we do that, we got to make sure we understand the difference between crime and deviance, right? So deviance is any vi any behavior that violates a norm. And we've talked about the informal norms and the formal norms, and we've also put them in terms of folkways and mores. Um, and that word is more, not mores, more, two syllables. Um, but mores are are basically formal norms. Um, you can you can you can basically interchange those. Um, and these are these are norms that are written down. They're codified. They're written into into a code somewhere somehow. Um, so laws are obviously the best examples, but there are also uh, some formal norms that aren't necessarily uh, in the legal world. A lot of you pointed out the idea of academic dishonesty, cheating on a test, plagiarism. These aren't things that are going to get you arrested. You're not violating the law, but there are formal sanctions that go that, that are that are that, that go against you if you violate that norm. So that is a written, codified norm. So it's a formal norm. It's a moray. Um, informal norms are less formal for lack of a, a better word, right? Informal norms aren't, you're not violating any laws, you're not violating any official rules of conduct. These are these sort of unwritten rules of how to behave and how to act in public um, or in any uh, given situation. So um, you know you're violating an informal norm or a folk way uh, because the reaction is that, that people tend to act kind of weird or uh, awkward around you. It's one of the hallmarks of autism, right? That people don't pick up on social cues. So people who are, are on that spectrum, on the autistic spectrum, often violate these sort of informal norms or folkways. Um, and again, it's nothing that's going to get them arrested. But they, they, but people who are autistic, to some extent, can't pick up on the social cues when people are trying to tell them, communicate to them that you know this is weird or this is odd. Uh, they don't really understand that. So the norms that they're tending to break are uh, informal. And it's because they don't pick up on those social cues that try to correct those sort of behaviors. Um, so deviance does, it's, it's going to be deviant regardless of what level of norm you're violating. If you're violating a norm, uh, it, it's, it's a deviant act. So crime is a little bit more specific. It violates the law. Those are going to be formal norms or mores, not all. Of course, not all formal norms and mores are are legal, uh, but if it is crime, it's got it's got to be uh, going against the law. Um, so crime is usually deviant, but it's not always. Lots of things are deviant, but not criminal. Right? Lots of things are deviant, but not criminal. Like we were just talking about those folkways. Uh, but uh, very few things are criminal, but not deviant. But there are a few. So it kind of breaks down like this. You got the the wider body of Deviant behavior. This big circle represents everything that might be deviant behavior that might be violating some sort of social norm. And then criminal behavior uh, is a smaller set of behaviors. But 
obviously it's it's a, there's a lot of overlap. Most of the things that are criminal are also going to be deviant. But there's a few things right here on this sort of sliver of uh, things that are criminal but not deviant, and this really demonstrates the sort of relativity of deviance, or what I like to call the fluidity of deviance, uh, because it's very rarely just kind of black and white. A little bit of speeding, if you're in, when you're driving a car, speeding uh, isn't necessarily deviant, but it is criminal. Going six, seven, eight, nine miles over the speed limit, uh, that's not really going to be considered deviant, right? But it is technically criminal. It is technically against the law to drive over the speed limit, but just by a little bit, that's 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 normal, right? We don't consider that abnormal. But going 20, 30, 40 miles an hour over the speed limit, that is definitely criminal and it's deviant, right? So the idea of speeding itself uh can't be put into one category of deviant or 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 non-deviant, right? Um it depends on the scale. Um other things that are that might be criminal but not deviant, depending on your circumstance, depending on where you are, uh, maybe smoking pot. If you're smoking pot in California, you are not violating any state laws, but you're actually still violating federal law. So it's kind of an interesting little mix there of what is normal, what is acceptable behavior, and what isn't. Um, so... There it is. I, 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 but I love this diagram, right? This, this idea that you can sort of see it, that most criminal behavior is deviant, but there is just there is a little bit. There are some exceptions. There are some criminal behaviors that are not deviant. But what my big focus is this: all this deviant behavior that is not criminal. So if you think back to our three key theoretical perspectives that we we've, we've talked about over and over again now. We got functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism. And functionalism has a lot to say about crime and deviance, and it's a good place to start um, because there is a function to deviance, right? There is a deviance and crime; they serve purposes in society. And we want to talk about that before we get into the more sort of complicated symbolic interactions and stuff. Um, so, what deviance does in society is to clarify norms. It sort of increases conformity, and I want to focus on this idea of clarifying norms, right? It reinforces boundaries of acceptable behavior. We need people to commit deviant acts so we know what deviance looks like. We know what unacceptable behavior or weird behavior or odd behavior looks like. Uh, so we know where to draw the line, right? But until somebody goes out and violates that norm until somebody breaks those rules, we're not sure where to draw the line. Because, again, a lot of this is real fluid. So the, it, it, violating a norm, come, it, it, it happens in degrees, right? So we'll talk about uh, PDA, public displays of affection, right? A little hand-holding, peck on the cheek here and there, that's not really deviant, but just you know sticking your tongue down somebody's throat right there in public, yeah, that's going to be deviant, right? But we don't know exactly where that line is until somebody goes too far, if that makes any sense. Um, so it strengthens social bonds among the reactions. So the reactions are really key. Um, when we talk about strengthening social bonds, we're talking about social cohesion and conformity. It gives people this sense of togetherness, right? It gives us some sort of evil, some not necessarily evil, but something, some bad thing, some no-no, some... So something that's not okay that we can all come together and say together, no, that's not okay. We're not we're not cool with that, um, and that increases this idea of, of collectivity of social cohesion. Um, so remember that one of the key tenets of functionalism: without social structure, humans would basically just be animals, right? Um, and again, you can agree or disagree with it, but that's just one of the key ideas behind functionalism, behind that perspective: is that left to our own devices. Humans are kind of just just crazy. So we need people to act deviantly, to step outside of the bounds of normal behavior so we know where to draw those lines so we can react together to condemn that behavior. And this is a, and, I, and I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, but this is a long quote from Emile Durkheim, who, again, he's one of our sort of founding fathers of sociology. Um, and... He sort of describes this process of how uh, crime, and he's speaking specifically about crime, but deviance in general 
can bring together people, right? Um, can bring together communities. And he got, introduces this idea of the public temper, uh, which is a really kind of neat concept. But the idea is that crimes and scandals, it brings people together in their universal condemnation, right? It makes people more alert to the values that they share, right? So when someone does something that is that is a deviant or uh, an astonishing sort of shocking, that's the word I'm looking for, sort of a shocking act, something that, 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 is, that is shocking to us, when we find other people who are also shocked by that act, it makes us more alert. It reinforces the idea that we have some unique values that we share. So that when we're coming together and, and sort of condemning this shocking act or just in, in sharing our shock, uh, it, it reinforces the, the idea that we have some, some, some things in common with those other people. So this is the idea of the collective conscience. The, 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 Derek kind of talked about this a lot, the idea that um, society as a whole, not society as a whole, but sort of people in groups tend to have sort of a, a, a group conscience, right? A, a group's idea of morality, right? So something that shocks that collective conscience, shocks the, this, the, the rules of morality, the group morality that we're, that, that we're reinforcing by our togetherness, um, that is sort of the definition of something that is deviant or criminal. It shocks that collective conscience. It seems to violate the group morals more than your individual morals. It shocks the group conscience, the collective conscience. So we're going to harp on this for a little bit, the reaction to a deviant act. That's how you know something is deviant. And again, this goes back to that functionalist definition, and then and then it leads right into the idea that we're going to talk about in the symbolic interaction is then how the way they study deviance is because you're not necessarily studying the, the act itself as much as you're studying the reactions to that act, right? So the act by itself happening in a vacuum isn't going to tell you much. We want to know how people are reacting to that action, and that's going to tell us whether or not the act is deviant, how deviant it is, and what the consequences of that action will be. So that's just really important, the idea that the reaction is how we know something is deviant. It's about how we define an act as deviant. Uh, it's not so much the act itself, but it's how people react to that action. And again, sociologists, sociology in general always takes the focus off the individual. The individual action might be the, the subject, might be the starting point. It's how we go into it. But the questions that we ask immediately starts to spread through all the circumstances that are around that individual action. Um, and specifically with deviant action and deviant behavior, we're looking at the reaction to that behavior. That's how we know something is deviant, is, is, is that people react to it in a, in a specific way, in a way that is uh, shocked or appalled or uh, some way that roundly condemns that behavior. When what's really important to understand or to point out, I guess, is that what is deviant, what we consider deviant, what we consider to be deviant can change over time. Um, it really wasn't that long ago that interracial dating was very much a deviant act uh, that was very frowned upon, especially here in the South, but it wasn't just in the South. Um, it was just very much, very frowned upon. And some of us probably still have parents or grandparents who disapprove of white people dating black people, especially. Uh, so, the, but that's changed over time, right? And we know that's changed because of the reactions, right? Um, to an extent, it's changed. Um, well, we can get more into that. But still, on the whole, it's not as deviant as it used to be. And so this is the idea that the idea that deviance can, or what we consider to be deviant can change over time, gets into this idea that, that uh, deviance is sort of a social construct, right? That means that uh, it is it is created. It's an amalgamation of different kind of social patterns. So uh, I want to I want to get through this. I want to get this idea of constructionism out there. Um, so the root word of uh, constructionist is construct or construct. So as a verb, it's construct. As a noun, it's a construct. 
Um, and so it's just something that is built, something that is put together. Um, and that's where we're dealing with how something is uh, created or maintained, a social phenomenon, a social fact. So it overlaps with symbolic interactionism because you got to think about the way we derive meaning from something. If we go back to our example of interracial dating, that used to mean something that it, it doesn't mean today as much, right? So the idea of what 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 a what it, what a certain type of behavior means to people can change over time. So of course there are some things that are going to be constants, right? You're never going to see a world where at least I hope you never really see a world where murder is not considered deviant, right? So there are things, especially in the criminal world, that are uh, going to always be deviant. But there are other things that definitely change over time as far as what we consider to be deviant behavior. Um, we used to think that tattoos and piercing were piercings were a little more deviant than they are now. Uh, we used to think, again, interracial marriage or... Uh, homosexuality was far less accepted, right? And so you can see where, 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 where what we consider to be deviant changes over time. Um, and a lot of times that comes, that, that is done intentionally. And that's the idea of, of what Howard Becker called, and Becker wrote the, the, the labeling theory, and we'll get to him more. But he got to this idea of moral entrepreneurs, um, so people that go after and try to generate public support to condemn a particular behavior. Um, and where it can go the other way to change the definition. So we had moral entrepreneurs who sought to change the way we view interracial relationships or same-sex relationships that has sort of shifted the culture. Um, so that's important. Um, now this next part that, I'm, that I want to show you, I think it works better. It, it, it's something that usually does a good job of generating some discussion. There's no one here to discuss this except it's just me. So, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. But I have to tell you that the, the, the pictures I'm about to show you uh, are from the Westboro Baptist Church. So they're going to use some pretty disgusting and vile language. But they do that intentionally. And, uh, and, and, and we'll talk about what they're hoping to achieve. Um, Let's just go right into it. So this is uh, Shirley Phelps, and she's married. She's Shirley Phelps, something I can't remember, but Shirley Phelps. Um, and so and she's wearing that, thank God, for cancer. So the idea that um, the ills that are befalling the country and, and bad things that are happening are happening because of uh, a certain, like, um, retribution from God, right? That's not necessarily all that deviant, right? Um, so just saying that bad things are happening to the country because of these cultural shifts in uh, homosexuality and the way we are, we are reacting to homosexuality and gay marriage, um, the idea that bad things are befalling the country because of that, I mean, that's not totally deviant. So the idea with the Westboro Baptist Church is that they wanted to be deviant. They wanted to... Uh, be these gadflies. They wanted to poke. They wanted to put things in the most uh, absurd, outrageous terms they possibly could. Um, so if we go back to, well, let's let's just look at some examples, right? It's it's not just saying that homosexuality is bad <clears throat> or it goes against God's will, because that's real common speech. We hear that. Well, if you listen to certain radio stations, you hear that all the time, right? Um, but Man, they just go right into the most vile language they can use to describe it. And then they also take uh, sensitive events like 9-11 and just put the, put the blame for that squarely on uh, a nation falling away from God. But again, they're not going to put it in such diplomatic terms. They want to be in your face. They want to make you mad. They want to violate norms. They want to be countercultural. They want to be deviant. Um, now, this is one of my favorite pictures from the Westboro Baptist Church because, first of all, this, this woman's reaction is just great. She's, you know, she's out here doing her job, and you know, 
she, she, she can't believe what she's protecting is what it looks like. But it, what the Westboro Baptist Church does, and actually let's, take, let's go back to uh, this slide right here. So the Westboro Baptist Church, they operated right on this line between what is deviant and what is criminal. They went right up to that line of criminality. Um, the woman in the picture is Shirley Phelps. She's a lawyer, uh, believe it or not. Um, Shirley Phelps is a lawyer, so she knows the law. She knows the codes. She knows how much she can get away with. And here she is literally going straight to the line of legality and pushing it just as far as she can push it uh, to get into your face to make you mad. And uh, again, I, I mentioned this in my little write-up at the beginning of the of this unit or this week's content that where they really found their niche, where they really found that they could, they could, they could get under everybody's skin was by protesting and dishonoring funerals of soldiers. And it really kind of reveals what's sacred in our American culture. Um, that the one thing that everybody could get behind and everybody could roundly condemn this group for was when they, uh, dishonored the sort of blood sacrifice of American soldiers. Um, and that's that's where it went. So um, I've always been fascinated by this group and, and, and the way they operate. They're deviant. And again, it's intentionally deviant. Um, but this is just one of my more favorite pictures. Again, something in this picture, something that she's doing is going to get you upset. If, if you're not upset by the language, then you're probably going to be upset by the fact that she's standing on an American flag, right? Um, but this is one of Shirley's daughters and who, again, outside of these crazy protests that they do and these things that just seem so absurd, and they are so absurd and so crazy, they're pretty normal kids. They go to school. They watch movies. Uh, at this point, Napoleon Dynamite's a pretty old movie, but this picture was taken when it was still popular. Um, but that's, that's, you know, coming from a very secular movie, and she's just kind of standing there being a normal teenager, not really into what she's doing, checking her phone. And again, it's an old picture. We're back in the days of flip phones here. But um, anyway, that's sort of an aside. I digress. The idea is that they want to be deviant. They are making this deviant action. They are creating their movement off an intentional effort to get people to react. So again, it's not the act itself that lets us know when they're crossing a line, it's the reaction to the act, right? That's the key. That's the key. The reaction is how we knew where, when they had gone too far. Now let's do something a little more controversial, as, 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 as much as that sounds, but it's something that, that divides people, right? Because we don't always universally condemn something. So... Colin Kaepernick takes a knee. And this is where it would be great for like a group discussion. And I would pose the question, is this a deviant act? When, when you know, when kneeling during the national anthem the way Colin Kaepernick did, is that deviant? Is that an act of deviant? Does that violate the social norms? Does that violate our, our sense of group morality? And for some people, uh, you know, it definitely did. It definitely did, right? Uh, you got the, the people who very came out and roundly condemned Colin Kaepernick. And you even had the idea of the moral entrepreneurs trying to make what Colin Kaepernick and, 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 and those folks were doing. Um, they wanted to make it more of a formal norm. If it was violating an informal norm, they wanted to switch that over and somehow put that behavior uh, into a code that was going to be disallowed, whether it was the NFL or whether it was a legislature but making, you know, that action uh, illegal or officially not allowed. And that would take it from the realm of formal, of informal norm to formal norm. Um, and, and that didn't really work so much. But what did work was uh, monetizing that movement, right? So uh, people, you, you've probably seen these T-shirts, right? T-shirts, hats. Uh, this guy's uh, Neil McCoy wrote a hit single, "Take Me My Ass," man. It's got it's got a lot of plays on uh, Spotify. 
I saw a Neil McCoy concert. He wouldn't play that song. I think he wanted to be known as more than that. But we were all there to hear that song, dude. You should play it. Um, so uh, there's so so those are the reactions. So there was the reactions to condemn uh, that act and define it as deviant, but it wasn't universal, right? There was a lot of people on the other side who uh, wanted to normalize that behavior. Um, and again, people monetize that part of the movement as well. Uh, so it just goes to show that, that, that what we consider to be deviant is often uh, not inherent. It has to be constructed. We have to come to define something as deviant. Um, and then there are people who will try to label something as deviant. And then there may also be people who go the other way with it. And so, you know, again, Colin Kaepernick taking that knee did serve a function by letting us, by, by giving us the opportunity to study the reactions to that action so we could understand whether or not it was deviant and how deviant it was. And we found evidence of, uh, of, of, of a lot of divisiveness. Um, right, so when we, when we go back to our definition, and let's do that real quick. If we go back to our definition of, I think it was here. Or yeah, yeah, when we, when we go back to our idea of the functionality of deviance and that it reinforces these social bonds, right? And that it uh, makes people aware or alert to the idea. Man, I put it somewhere. There it is. That's what I'm looking for. The idea that it makes people more alert to the values that they share, right? Um, it revealed deep divisions in where our values are as, as a country and as a society. Because for some folks, Colin Kaepernick taking that knee was very much a violation of things that they're valuing. And for other folks, uh, it wasn't. And so it made people more alert to the values that they share with some people and, and that they don't share with other people. So, um, again, and I'm not trying to take a side here on the whole Colin Kaepernick thing. Uh, I just from a sociology perspective, it's fascinating to see the reactions. Again, not the act itself, but how people react from support to round condemnation. And again, uh, and this will get into the sort of the conflict theory. Remember that conflict theory is mostly about uh, the economy, right? And how everything becomes a, a, a commodity in the capitalist system. Uh, the anger towards capital, towards Colin Kaepernick and towards kneeling during the national anthem, man, that was commodified quick, fast, and in a hurry. T-shirts, hit singles, uh, the other side, the support, also commodified, packaged up into an ad uh, to sell shoes. It, you know, <laughs> whatever you value, whatever you hold dear, man, we can, people will make money off of it. Um, all right, so that was a big digression. That was a big caveat, but the whole point of it was mostly that uh, it was an example of how deviance and what what deviance means to certain people can can shift. Right, that the the, the definition of deviance is not absolute as much as it is negotiated or constructed. Now, of course, there, there's there's some things that are always going to be deviant, right? murder, torture, rape, these things are always going to be bad. Um, so, again, we're not talking about the violent crime, the serious crime aspect of deviance here. We're just talking about uh, that, that, that larger circle of deviance from our, from our Venn diagram, right? You remember that one? Uh, we're, we're, we're looking at all the things that are outside of the criminal that are still deviant uh, for right now. So... When we look at these reactions, one other way to think of them is in sanctions, right? And sanctions are what we would call consequences for violating certain rules. Um, so uh, you hear the word sanction a lot, like right now we have sanctions on Iran, 
uh, the United States has sanctions on Iran, has sanctions on Russia. Uh, and that's just sort of penalties for what we've done or even the threat of penalties for for what they've done uh, or what they might do. Um, so that's the idea. Sanctions, think of, them, think of them as penalties, right? So we have formal sanctions, and those correspond to the formal norms or the mores. So that's where we have the idea of, of, of codified written laws and rule breaking. Um, so formal sanctions are things like, uh, you know, going into the criminal justice system, being incarcerated, being, going onto probation or parole, or if you do something like uh, violate the academic dishonesty policy at school. So again, it's not illegal, but there will be a formal response. It'll be an official response. Uh, it's, it's written down. Uh, so the sanction on that policy uh, is, is documentable. Documentable. It can be documented. Um, so that's 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 what we're that's what we're looking for there. Uh, so the informal sanctions are a little bit harder, right? They come, they correspond to informal norms or folk ways. They're not written down, not typically, um, and so they're usually much more subtle. But sometimes you know, they don't have to be subtle. But they can come in the form of just a general confusion or awkwardness. Um, so like. Let's say if I did my video like this, and I just talked like this the whole time, like that would be odd. You would be confused. You wouldn't know what was going on. Like, why is he showing the back of my head? I don't know what looking at my face really does for you, right? Does it do anything for you? Does it make you know, the lecture better? No, well, probably not. It just, but it does alleviate confusion, right? It keeps you from getting distracted, right? Because if I'm doing the whole video with with the back with showing you the back of my head you'd be less uh i believe you'd probably be less concerned with what i was saying and more like why the heck is he doing that um so that's an example of sort of these informal uh norms right and so uh and then there's all sorts of ways that you can violate informal norms and the idea is that you'll know it's deviant when the reaction is to somehow correct that behavior. So that's what we're going to do this week, or for this week. That's what our, our, our assignment is. We'll call these breaching experiments. I had to go back and edit that slide because I want to include that word. Uh, we call these breaking ex breaching experiments, and that's where you're sort of breaching one of these sort of real informal, benign norms. So again, uh, right away, I want... The idea is to observe the the reaction, right? You want to see what sanctions you receive for violating this norm. Um, the idea is that somehow the people around you are going to try to find a way to sort of correct that behavior. And they can do it by giving you funny looks, uh, maybe saying something rude to you. But, but we don't want to get too, again, we don't want to push the envelope too much, right? You don't want to do anything illegal. Definitely nothing illegal. Definitely nothing illegal. Nothing that can be perceived as illegal. Nothing that's dangerous. Nothing that threatens people or or makes people feel threatened. Right. Um, so, I've I've got a ton of examples of of people who have maybe gone too far. Um, here's one. I, I, there was there was some people I was in college with. They decided to do a breaching experiment where they bought a brand new glass pipe. A glass pipe that would typically be used to smoke marijuana, but they're legally sold because ideally, I guess you, you, you could smoke tobacco out of them. And they bought this brand new glass pipe, and so it had no marijuana residue in it or anything. Uh, so it wasn't illegal. It's totally legal to buy, totally legal to possess. Um, and so they bought a brand new one, and they just put tobacco in it, and they sat down on campus at Western Carolina in Cullowee, and they just passed a bowl back and forth smoking tobacco. Uh, and of course, uh, campus security came and you know, they got out of it. They said that they, they, it was on a college campus, so the idea that they were doing it as part of a sociology class made sense to the campus police. But again, man, y'all don't, don't need to get that crazy with it. Don't get that crazy with it. Don't do anything that's going to immediately attract the police. Uh, just, just, you know, 
don't don't get crazy, right? The idea is to keep it benign, right? I love that word benign. It's harmless. It's not going to hurt anybody. Um, and, the, and remember that, that you want it to be perceived by the audience to be harmless. Don't get beat up. Don't make anyone feel unsafe. Uh, so, you know, again, I have, I've, there, there, are, there are bad examples of uh, I, I, the, one of my classmates in undergrad did an abridging experiment where he uh, uh, violated urinal etiquette. And that is, if you're in a men's bathroom and there's a, you know, a, a series of four urinals, if one person is in there using a urinal on the far left-hand side, right, you're, so, you're not supposed to go and use the urinal right next to them. If there's an option to leave an empty space between you and the next person to leave an empty urinal, you're supposed to do that, right? That's not, and that's not a written, it's not a written rule anywhere. But man, if you violated that norm, it can really, it can actually really make people feel unsafe. So again, I don't necessarily recommend doing that. Uh, but it was, but it, I mean, it was kind of funny. But uh, again, it, it could be interpreted as threatening, and you and you want to avoid that. Um, so the assignment is uh, going to be written a lot like your field work uh, assignment. Same thing. So I want you to 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 go out there somewhere in the world, violate a norm. Receive some sanctions, whether it's funny looks or, uh, you know, whatever it might be, uh, laughter, something. I want you to see how people react, and I want you to document those sanctions, right? Um, and that's the key word. You are looking at the reactions. You're looking at the sanctions. You're asking your question, how are people, how are the society, how do the people around me try to keep me from doing that? action again? How do they let me know that what I'm doing is deviant, is not really acceptable? So uh, again, just like the fieldwork assignment, I want you to first off, I want you to, after you get done with the action, I want you to just go back and write down everything you remember. Uh, and then uh, go back, after you let it sit for a little while, go back and revisit the description, reflect on what happened, and then uh, ask yourself the questions about how this behavior was being sanctioned and how the people around you were discouraging you from doing it again. They might not have, you know, said, hey, don't do that anymore. But they might. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, you know, so the idea is that the, you, you you write a be at least a page and a half or so of what happened, and then just another half page or so of, of why you think that happened uh, and sort of interpreting the action and... Uh, so that's the goal. So um, again, you're looking for these, uh, how these informal norms or these unwritten rules of interaction are enforced uh, without ever being written or often not even spoken. Maybe they will become spoken if you violate the norm. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so I'll post a little bit more information about this. Uh, but that's the goal. Uh, I want you to not get in trouble. Again, don't get in trouble. Don't get in trouble uh run some ideas past me i i'm, I'm not going to require that you get your action approved i'm going to give you guys a little bit of trust um and say that i, I think y'all know what's going to keep you safe but and yeah, don't prove me wrong right don't do anything because you know, there's a chance one person one person could ruin this assignment for forever uh so don't be that don't be that person uh so that's, that's, that's what we got. So again, so that's what we got for this week. We are mostly looking just at deviance this week, deviant behavior that, uh, and how something is defined as deviant and how that definition of how, of, uh, how that definition of deviance is maintained, right? So we're taking a real constructionist approach to deviance this week. We're looking at how it's fluid and how it's sort of relative. And we're also looking at how it's built and how it's maintained. Um, so that's the idea. That's the goal. Uh, go out there, take care of yourselves, be safe, um, and have some fun with it. Uh, next week, we'll talk more about the more heavy uh, crime stuff, uh, the, the, criminology, the criminology theories and the criminal justice system. Uh, again, I might not have mentioned this at the top, but it's a great time uh, in our chapter or in our, in our textbook to go and review that uh, documentary, 13th. It's available on Netflix, and I'll give you some extra credit 
uh, for watching it. So go and check out the extra credit folder in Blackboard. Uh, watch that. Write a little essay for me, and uh, I'll give you some extra credit on your midterm. On the midterms, I'll get to those. Uh, and I don't want to guarantee I'll get them graded this week, but I'll do my level best. Um, all right, that's what I got. Y'all uh, enjoy the rest of your week and weekend.